Hi, I'm Cosmo Lee. I'm here with Nick Cave. We're here in his hotel room in New York before his show promoting his most recent record, Dig Lazarus Dig. So the title uh, song of your new album, you set the character in New York. Why New York? Why not somewhere else? Um, well, I wanted to I wanted to explore in a comic way what happened to Lazarus after uh, he was raised from the dead. You know, you kind of never find out. And I just thought I'd put it in a kind of super contemporary environment, you know, in the biggest, baddest city, you know, there is. And New York seemed to be the right, right place to do that. Do you feel any affinity for the city? I haven't really I noticed do, it. I do, actually, yeah. I like it a lot. I, sp I spent a lot of here, a lot of time here 20 years ago or something. I mean, I think I lived here for about eight months or something like that. What's the draw for you? Well, there's just a kind of, there's a, there's a manic energy about New York that I find attractive. Do you ever find it un unhealthy in any way, especially as you grow older? Well, it used to be a lot unhealthier, didn't it? <laughs> right. You could actually get shot and stuff. Right, right. Can't, that didn't happen so much at all, mm -hmm. sadly. You said that the Lazarus story creeped you out as a child. Why was that? Well, I mean, Christ digs up some, you know, some, raises some guy after being dead for three days, and that always just sort of struck me as kind of, I mean, it strikes me now as okay. pretty obscene in its way as well, but, but at the, at, as a little kid, I mean, just, uh, the, the, you know, that, that did creep me out. I mean, no one asked him, right? I'm oh, sure. <laughs> uh, having done Grinder Man before your latest uh, Bad Seeds album, do you think the Grinder Man experience affected the sound? The sound yeah, it had a huge effect. Yeah. I mean, it was, it, was, it was very much what we needed. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of members in the Bad Seeds, and, you know, w without actually going into the studio and saying, OK, this, like, like I did with, say, The Boatman's Call, you know, you're not playing largely mm -hmm. on this, you know, just sit there mm -hmm. and, you know, and because of this, this, this sort of record is about the piano, bass and drums or something like that. Without going in and saying that, which I did with that particular record, everyone... You know, you, you, I, I play a song and everyone sits down and starts to play it. So mm -hmm. you get this kind of, with the bad seeds, you get this massive sound. And we wanted to do something with Grinder Man that was really stripped back to, a, mm -hmm. to, to very much a four piece and the directness of, the, of a four piece. And so a lot of, I think, the, you know, Dig Lazarus Dig is very, very much more a stripped down kind of record. Mm -hmm. And now the, the, the kind of, the thing that's interesting us is where the next Grinder Man record goes. We're completely free to do whatever we like. There's, we don't feel with Grinder Man that, that, that we have to live up to anyone's expectations or that we have to, the next Grinder Man record has to be, um, it can be whatever we want it to be. And you don't feel um, that with The Bad Seeds? The Bad Seeds, is, we've, it's like 14 albums or something like that. And there's, there's a history there, whether, whether we like it or not. I mean, this is actually changing. This is one of the kind of interesting things I think that happened possibly with the Grinder Man record, and as a consequence, the Dig Lazarus Dig record, is that the audience changed. Um, there's a definite change in, in the way we are perceived by the audience that we have now than we had, say, five years ago. Mm -hmm. they don't, it's like they don't really know what the records were beforehand, or they don't understand, they, they're not really conscious of the whole Nick Cave thing and all mm -hmm. of that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. They just go there and they get down the front and they kind of groove away to the music and like it's just a gig. Mm -hmm. And that's really kind of exciting. It's taken a lot of pressure off me in terms of being this kind of front man kind of thing that I can kind of sink back into the band a bit and be a part of the band in the way that, that I used to be. So that, that's, been a, that's, that's something that Grinder Man did, which, was, which is, is hugely exciting for me. In a live context, I can go on stage now and we can just go fucking bananas and I'm part of a band again. You just don't get, the, you don't get that kind of backing band sort of feel with the Bad Seeds anymore. After you left Australia with your band and, and you went to London, this was in the early 80s, what was that time like? We went from an environment that was very, in Australia, which was richly creative at that particular time. There was, there was all sorts of things happening on, in the art scene in Melbourne. And, and we, we went to England and it was like the opposite in every way. There was nothing going on there. They were kind of desperate times in the sense that there was about 10 of us living in a one bedroom uh, bedsit. 
we all went over with uh, uh, our manager who left a week later and said, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to do this <laughs> for a living and took any money that we had back with him. So we were in, we were in quite, quite a desperate situation. But the, but the worst thing of all, the worst part about it was that England itself as a country was uh, real, really disappointing to us because we'd grown up as kids thinking that, you know, everything happened in London. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you could only just get to London, everything would be all right. Mm -hmm. And when we arrived, it was um, it was shocking. We found it sort of shocking. So, so it was only till we then we left there after a couple of years and went to Berlin. And that was the place where you wrote your book. Now it's it's almost been twenty years later after the book. What do you think of it? It never had an editor. That book. It was I just sort of handed in the manuscript. Then the guy was publishing it, and me sat down and and edited ourselves, which in retrospect I think was a mistake. I think we needed someone outside the book to, to look at it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's 20 years or something and we're gonna, we've, we've done a kind of um, a slight reordering of it and, and um, chopped away some of the more obscure, difficult stuff. But I've now written another novel. What can you say about the new novel? Well, I finished it like the day before yesterday. Oh, awesome. Congratulations. Um, <laughs> What's the setting? Maybe a few characters. Well, it's about a, uh, a sexually uh, incontinent hand cream salesman. Okay. And it's, it's, it's funny and it's uh, sad. Do you find writing a novel, which of course is longer in text than a song, do you find it more difficult because of that? I find it easier. Awesome. I find it easier because once you've got the initial theme, you, you, you can throw, you can, you're just throwing yourself back into the same story. So it's really a matter of just um, sitting down and, and continuing to write. The song I find, uh, of, of all the different things, the most difficult of, of them all. You know, each song is about the, the original idea and, and sitting there and finding what you want the next song to be about. Mm -hmm. That's the difficult part. That's always the difficult part. To, of any of these sorts of things. Are you starting to find your balance tipping towards non-musical projects then? Well, uh, no, because for me at the end of the day there's something about music that feels to me uh, it's a greater thing and it's a more important thing. Rock and roll music is often kind of belittled as being the kind of... The, the, I mean, my father used to, my, my father used to think that Shakespeare and poetry, and poetry in particular, was kind of up here, and everything sort of, and rock and roll music was was hardly on the ladder at all. It was mm. just a joke. Mm. And I listened to that stuff for years growing up, and then at some point it occurred to me that he was wrong, and that 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 actually rock and roll it's, it's that, that rock and roll music is this extraordinary, and that that it has the effect of literally changing your life and your entire body chemistry and stuff within a few seconds. And it's something that I get from that and I've got from other, not from making my own music, but from listening to other people's music, I've got that I've never really gotten from a novel or looking at a painting. There's certain musicians like Nina Simone, for example, or Bob Dylan or Leonard Cohen. If they didn't actually, if they didn't exist, any one of those people, my life would, would, be, would be significantly different. But I could probably get away with not having read Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky or something. <laughs>